could be in terms of what is in, in, intrinsically possible, a distinction he believes Spinoza and Bale overlook. God cannot now change anything in the order of the world without derogation to his wisdom. Therefore, physical evil, including earthquakes, floods, disease, and droughts, are part of the pre-established harmony, and God could not have made the world better, that is, less prone to earthquakes, disease, floods, and droughts, given the arrangement of the whole. To make this sound plausible is a pretty tall order, but it's precisely this challenge that Leibniz has to take up to underpin his theodicy. Earthquakes like storms and epidemics, hold Spinoza in the first part of the ethics, have always been thought to happen because the gods whom men judge to be of the same nature as themselves are angry due to wrongs done to them by men or sins committed in their worship. And although their daily experience contradicted this, and infinitely many examples showed that fortunate and unfortunate things happen indiscriminately to the pious and impious alike. Men do not on that account abandon their long-standing prejudice. It's easier for them to put this among the other unknown things whose purpose they are ignorant of and so remain in the state of ignorance in which they were born rather than cancel that whole construction and think up a new one. So Spinoza's elimination of all teleology and final ends and Bale's separation of morality from theology imply a moral and social revolution. Moral values have now to be reconstructed on a new basis, and that basis is the equivalence in Spinoza of every individual's needs and interests, treating each individual's interests as being equal. Uh, Changing the moral order so that it's based on equality leads finally to political revolution based on principles of freedom and equality of interest, abolishing all privilege and rank under the law and in the eyes of the state. The most effective defense of the accepted moral order anchored in religion and natural theology and fundamentally distinct from a moral system focusing collective and individual well-being in this world remains Leibniz's theodicy. This means that it's not just a defense of the existing moral order, but also ultimately a defense of princely authority, ecclesiastical authority, and aristocratic privilege. In a way, Leibniz's theodicy is thus a fortifying of the Ancien Regime against revolution, against that universal revolution threatening all existing values and tradition, which Leibniz, with his masterly insight, appears to have been the very first to envisage as the ultimate implication of free thinking, atheism, and Spinozism, as he does. This is a, an observation which I owe to my friend Vittorio Hursley, is also with us here this evening. Uh, I, I didn't realize this till I saw this in one of his books. Uh, he points it out in one of his books, which uh, li a prediction that uh, Leibniz makes in his new essays in 1704. Astonishing prescience, really. Predictions that, uh, that, that materialism and Spinozism would produce uh, in a revolution horrible, as uh, Voltaire puts it in one place, uh, become very frequent by the 1770s and 80s. Uh, in German as well as in French, there are lots of them in, in Lichtenberg, in Albrecht von Halle, in all sorts of places, there are lots of predictions that there was going to be a great revolution. Uh, something that uh, serious people, I think, uh, could see with some clarity by a certain point. But nobody else points this out at such an early stage as Leibniz does, which is surely something quite extraordinary. The crux of Leibniz's answer, and I've been going on too long, but I'll finish very, very shortly. The crux of Leibniz's answer to Spinoza and Bale is that they are both confusing what is necessary by moral, uh, are both confusing what is necessary by uh, not moral necessity, that is according to the principle of wisdom and goodness with what is so by metaphysical and brute necessity, which occurs when the contrary implies contradiction. If things connected together could be separated, the parts from the whole, the humankind from the universe, God's attributes, the one from the other, power from wisdom, it may be said that God can cause virtue to be in the world without any mixture of vice and even that he can do so easily. But since he, he, ha he has permitted vice, it must be said that that order of the universe which was found preferable to every other plan required it. Uh, 
Leibniz's answer to Spinoza and Bale was the best any philosopher has ever produced in answer to the great physical disasters from the perspective of theism and was powerfully echoed later after the great Lisbon earthquake in 1755. There, there were other earthquakes at the end of the 1740s and in the early 80s. Uh, 1750s. Uh, the, the Lima was completely destroyed in 1749. Earthquakes, the earthquake controversy is actually one of the great philosophical controversies of the middle of the 18th century, internationally, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, and very, very fascinating. After the great Lisbon earthquake in 1755, an event that horrified and shocked all Europe, uh, what really is the substance of Rousseau's reply to his open letter to Voltaire, who, of course, expressed despair and wondered whether divine providence, after all, governs the course of uh, the world and of nature. And here Rousseau replies to Voltaire's pessimistic musings in his poem on the Lisbon disaster. And he in doing so, he concentrates, um, he says that to concentrate on individual cases is misleading. Divine providence is general in character, not something permeating individual cases. We must assume that God ordered the whole for the best. Leibniz, the Odyssey, is a solution that pivots on the insight that divine reward and punishment cannot be of this world, but must await the next. So much so that immortality of souls is the very foundation of the moral and social order. Rousseau's reply to Voltaire is almost, almost repeats exactly Leibniz's argument and would be unthinkable without his recent rebellion against the materialism and Spinozism of his former friends, Diderot and Dolbach, who he just quarreled with. But it was the materialism of Diderot and Dolbach, not Rousseau's divine providence, theism, and morality of the heart that laid the basis for the revolutionary doctrine of equality and uh, a world that was truly made to bring Asia, Africa, the Americas, and Europe into one uh, universal community based on one uh, morale universelle, uh, as Dolbach called it, and uh, one uh, conception of uh, a democratic republican society which would best fit the interests uh, of all. Thank you very much. We did have a late start, so we will have time for some questions. Perkins, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Jonathan, you maybe find this a little curious coming from me. Um, I think we should be careful about not overstressing the influence of Spinoza. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, I didn't quite catch I, that. I Could you I say that think, again? I think there's, 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 a, there's a risk of overstressing Spinoza's <laughs> importance in relation to, 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 to Leibniz's theodicy. I think it's something that also relates to the notion that you, you speak of, of Leibniz's uh, talk about the, the, the threat of, 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 of universal revolution and things like as a presence and something that is towards. I think often, if you look into the preliminary discourse, that Leibniz squarely situates the problem of the fatum spinosanum within, all, and, and, and also the spinocistic conception of, 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 of uh, the impossibility of reconciling faith and reason and things like that. He squarely situates it within debates which are actually behind him uh, uh, that goes back to, to, to much earlier and, and, and situates Spinozism in the context of uh, pardon of errorism, for example, uh, and earlier doctrines, and especially when he is speaking about uh, the questions of, um, of, of uh, universal revolution, the, 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 the risk of or also what he sometimes calls universal anarchy. Uh, the context in which this goes on is within, the, the, when he speaks about free thinking as a danger here, is often in relation to this before. So we're speaking about free thinkers of the libertine kind, uh, uh, Francis before, Francois Lamotte-Leveillé, and the one he most often mentions is, is Gabriel Naudet. 
as the one of the, the, the dangerous ones. So that's that's part of this danger, uh, which is related to 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 to, to free thinking, uh, uh, mm -hmm. at least in the preliminary discourse. The other part of it is also the the the, the fright of of, of universal. Uh, uh, um, of universal revolution and universal anarchy that he's trying to sort of combat. Also looking, he's also looking back to the Anabaptists and things like that, so, so all the way back to the 16th century. So I think there's something conservative in the way in which Leibniz treats free thinking within the framework of the theodicy, which sometimes looks back to threats that took place I mean, before the Thirty Years' War, and has something to do with the Thirty Years' War, rather than looking forward towards the French Revolution, and so on. Yeah. So that, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm saying maybe not overstressing Spinozism in this, because maybe not, when he's speaking about free thinking and Spinozism, it's always squarely situating within these, 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 these debates that he says, well, Spinozism is a form of free thinking of this type, which is an earlier one. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's always um, a slight problem of um, the, the Spinozism as the philosophy of Spinoza, which is one thing, and the usage in the late 17th and early 18th century would become quite normal, uh, perhaps especially due to Bale, to see Spinozism also as a tendency and also as a historical tradition. And... Uh, um, uh, doctrines like um, Spinozismus anti Spinozam were very uh, well uh, known and, and, and used in this period. And uh, Spinoza is, is, is seen as an individual and as a system of philosophy, um, but also as a tendency which was thought to, in parts, to reach back to ancient times and to be something that was very widespread. And is it even dealt with uh, in the, the world's uh, book about this appeared recently, the, the, the world's first real encyclopedia of religion, which came out in Holland in the 1730s, the um, ceremonies and religious customs of all the peoples of the world, appeared in English translation as well as in several editions in French. Uh, actually, so we're talking about... Um, uh, fairly early 18th century date, around 1730, this must have been written, actually has a section on Spinozism as if it's one of the world's uh, religions or a variant of deism or something like that. So uh, there, there's a certain... Uh, Spinozism has to be understood in, in, in not, not in two different senses because I think it, it, it's not a vague term. It, it, it's meant to be a, a body of doctrine which is firmly tied to Spinoza, but not just tied to Spinoza, but to a much wider span of free thinking as well. So Spinoza, perhaps one way to think of it is of Spinoza is the person who, as Bale says in one place, who, who, who gave what is in, in part at least an ancient tradition, reaching all the way back to Epicureanism and Lucretius, but gave it its most systematic and coherent shape and form. This question may reflect having not read enough of Hume's essays on particular moral topics, but I was surprised at your comment that even in Hume, there, uh, morality comes from tradition and requires us to have faith in the divine benevolent ordering of the universe, because um, in the treatise, at least, maybe not in some of his later essays, but in the treatise, there's a very strong emphasis on natural sentiment and social utility, things that have been instituted are not natural, but have been instituted for reasons of social utility. And while there are at least comments to the effect of what you said on the religious side and the dialogues, I'm reluctant no. to put you know, too much confidence that we can infer Hume's real views based on the character of the dialogue. So where yeah. do those comments about yeah. a tradition and yeah. a religion for morality come from? Yeah, no, I think they're necessitated by something which is also very strong early on in Hume. You see it very clearly in the treatise where he keeps saying that uh, reason is a weak instrument and we can't base the moral order, uh, we can't base our moral philosophy on reason. So what are we going to base it on if, if we're not serious about religion, which Hume surely wasn't? Uh, then we have to base it on a tradition on what most people think. Sentiment and feeling in Hume and the way we acquire 
uh, a moral sense of what is right and wrong has a lot to do with what people approve of and disapprove of. Yes. And I think indirectly it reaches back to, this is why Hume was quite serious about, he may not been, have been a serious believer, but he was a serious supporter of the Anglican Church because he knew very well that uh, most people's moral ideas were determined by religious traditions, and it's those traditions, it seems to me, which are the, actually the basis of the moral order, according to Hume, because he can't base it 